panel on Hello. education for new civilization. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which, which you can use to change the world. Our moderator for this session is Dr. Faiz Shah, Head Development Management and Director Yunus Center for the Asian Institute of Technology. Dr. Shah, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session. Please introduce our speakers and help us with ensuring that we use our time as productively as possible. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Monica. And uh, starting uh, right away, going straight into our introductions. Uh, well, first, the introduction. Uh, we're, we're really grateful to be able to join uh, Professor Yunus in this second panel today on education for new civilization. Uh, the, the good news is that we're going to have Professor Yunus with us all through, and we'll benefit from some insights uh, from him as well. Uh, and then, of course, each one of you brings such a 360 perspective on education, on development, on international cooperation, as well as, uh, uh, you know, have seen firsthand the challenges that uh, what we've uh, really put upon ourselves as educators in the past few years, that it's going to be really a tough thing to encapsulate everything into like two or three minutes sound bites. So I apologize right up, up front for that because you know, you know the, uh, the time is such that we were limited to this. But I have recommended that we use the 10 minutes that we have for the open Q&A for any additional thoughts that we might come. And of course, there, there's going to be uh, insights from Professor Yunus as well. So with, with that, let's get straight into the conversation. And my pleasure first to introduce Baroness uh, Valerie Amos, who is now Master of uh, University College at Oxford. Uh, brilliant career as an educator uh, at SOAS, as a diplomat, as a, a member of the House of Lords, uh, as a life peer and a cabinet minister. If I go into the full introduction, it'll take all time, uh, Baroness. So allow me to just uh, refer to you to the first question, that as an educator, apart from your other many accomplishments. Uh, what has been the major shift that you've seen in education uh, before and after COVID? And I'm, I'm referencing this to Professor Yunus's vision of a new civilization, which this opportunity of COVID has actually uh, provided for us. Over to you. Uh, so thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Professor Yunus, um, as always a pleasure to see you again and thank you for bringing us all together. And uh, Dr. Shah, thank you for uh, moderating um, our panel. As you said, I don't think it's just um, COVID that has resulted in us having to think about a range of uh, issues in the context of education. I think uh, if I look at the UK, um, the issues raised by the Black Lives Matter movement uh, the climate emergency and issues around environmental sustainability, the Me Too movement, and uh, the campaign um, against sexual violence against um, women, widening inequality in the UK and globally, and also, I think, specifically uh, thrown up by COVID, the digital uh, divide. And concerns that our students have about uh, what is happening economically, what is going to happen to them in terms of the kinds of jobs they go into. Uh, but critically for them, I think a range of ethical issues around the quality of life that they will have. What kind of society are they uh, inheriting? And there are some big uh, ethical issues there in terms of they push us as universities in terms of our um, investment, where does our money go? What is the impact, what has been the impact on education? I would frame it in three things, if I may. One is, how do we teach? Um, so mixed uh, methods as a result of what we have learned through COVID. The importance of face-to-face -face, um, engagement for critical debate. It's much harder to dismiss arguments um, if you are arguing with people uh, face to face, the importance of analysis and uh, facts. Uh, what we teach, there has been a big push in the UK in terms of what's broadly been called the decolonization agenda, but it is really about are we integrating perspectives from different parts of the world, different kinds of uh, thinking, opening our minds, 
uh, to different cultural perspectives. And the final thing I would say is what do we assess and how? As institutions of learning, we have, I think, for a long time depended on very traditional methods of assessment. And these have been challenged, uh, particularly as a result of uh, COVID and what we have had uh, to open our minds to uh, in the last few months. And I think going forward, this will be a major challenge uh, for us in terms of making sure that as we make our institutions more inclusive, more diverse, that we are giving every student an opportunity uh, to be the best that they can and to demonstrate uh, that impact. Thank you. Wonderfully uh, timed as well. Thank you very much, Baroness. Uh, these three points basically will reverberate through this conversation because how we teach is now under challenge. Our traditional face-to-face uh, -face and classroom training has suffered uh, during the pandemic. We also had to learn new ways of reaching out to students. Students have had to completely reacclimatize to uh, what they imagined classrooms to be, uh, learning remotely, etc. So I, I think that will continue to come back to us as a challenge. But then on the other hand, uh, digital connectivity and AI have taken uh, strides during this time. And so if I may uh, 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 introduce Professor Gillies now, who is uh, pr a principal and uh, vice chancellor of Glasgow Caledonian University. She also has a sterling academic career having been on the boards uh, of uh, RFK Human Rights UK, Grameen Caledonian College of Nursing in Dhaka, the National University of Science and Technology in Oman, and also the Glasgow Caledonian New York College. Uh, she has fellowships from the Royal College of Physicians of Glasgow and London, and the Academy of Social Sciences and the Royal Society of um, uh, Edinburgh. Has an international career, uh, taught at Harvard, taught at a number of other universities and continues to inspire uh, a new generation of students. Professor Gillies, shall we get straight into this challenge of teaching, if you may, of course, with, with in, in, in addition to whatever else uh, that you might wish to share with us, please. Thank you so much, Clyde, and thank you for that generous introduction. Well, how to follow Baroness Amos? She's said it all so succinctly. So I'll go at a slight tangent because you're right, Faiz, we've all pivoted towards online learning and we've all been successful in doing that in universities across the world and our universities remain our anchor institutions locally as well as nationally delivering for our economies delivering through creativity innovation and through research and it's quite astonishing that for most universities around the world the population of students have actually grown during the COVID pandemic. So it tells us something about the need for universities um, and about the fact that the online experience has potentially democratized uh, uh, higher education globally, or it should have the ability to further democratize higher education. The COVID vaccine developments did, however, emphasize the absolutely essential and vital need for international sharing, cooperation and collaboration to solve our most challenging global problems. And technology has also been an enabler in that research and problem solving sphere. But I was just thinking about this, you know, has the pandemic really caused us to rethink the educational ecosystem in the way we should be following this big crisis, to use the extraordinary resource of our universities and to do so more significantly to promote social mobility, anti-racism, equality and employment and reduce climate impact and poverty. There's an awful lot talked about it, but I'm going to say, well, no, not really, or maybe not yet. Whilst most of us use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as our framework for work and action, there is COVID crisis accepted, still limited interdisciplinary connection across these SDGs within universities and other organizations and public bodies, or across networks of all types of universities across the world, famous or less famous, big or small, to deliver impact for the world in education at scale. 
And I think we need to be not just better connected universities globally, uh, but more, we need more universities and in difficult places. And they need to have a sustainable, affordable funding model, like of course, Unisys social business model. Over eight years ago, and I'll finish with this little anecdote, I discussed with Emilio Botin, who was then chair of Santander Bank, whether we could create an affordable university in the heart of one of the poorest favelas in Rio de Janeiro, where he was thinking about opening a local bank with lots of safety measures. Sadly, Emilio died before this idea could be developed. But here's a provocation. If universities following this pandemic are to be remain our engines of the economy, our engines for jobs and of innovation, why don't we take them to the places where they are most needed, use participative models, have local champions, develop local pride in the outcomes, and thereby develop a new network of universities, universities for development, emerging from the poorest, but nevertheless talented parts of our poorest cities and countries. And technology we find can be enabler, but as Baroness Emma said, it can't be the whole solution because learning requires face-to-face -face peer learning, how that sparks the imagination and the creative juices of young and old alike. Thank you so much. It, it sort of really unpacks this uh, dilemma that we have of you know face-to-face -face versus uh, technology access. But two things that I, I think uh, we, we uh, have picked up on uh, through our various experiences in this panel also is that access equals opportunity. Lack of opportunity equals poverty. This is what Professor Yunus has always uh, sent out as his primary message. It's about opportunity if we're looking at poverty and a lack of access. So that's one. And the second thing is affordability. In, in today's world, uh, the, the, the price of higher education is, is itself a huge glass ceiling for a lot of very bright people. But I'm also, uh, as I move to our next speaker, uh, I'm reminded of, I think, a quote, of, of a, something that Professor Yunus said in 2011 in Dhaka, uh, that he sees a time where the universities go to the student as opposed to university, uh, students having to go to university. And in the years, in the decade that has followed that statement, uh, we've seen things happen in that direction. And I think we're now poised at a point where uh, access and affordability will, will be determined by how we set up our university systems. I'm going to introduce uh, Sharifa Sofia um, Al-Bukhari from Malaysia. And uh, uh, again, uh, as one of the trustees of the Al-Bukhari Foundation and also a corporate leader uh, as part of a family that invests uh, their uh, business uh, investments into, into education. I was going to address uh, perhaps, uh, Sharifa, to you this, uh, this trail or this question about affordability and access, because I think there's something that you might have to uh, share with us from, from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Faiz. And thank you to my inspiration, Professor Muhammad Yunus, for this opportunity. It is truly an honor to be able to share the stage with such a distinguished panel. Rather than merely putting forth the most important shift, which undeniably is the acceleration of technical adoption, as well as the increased capacity of universities, I would like to emphasize a key observation during the pandemic, which is the exclusion of a significant number of students from the education system at all levels. The twofold impact of the pandemic on education is the following. First, the infrastructure to accommodate online learning was inadequate and low income households were at an immediate disadvantage. The prerequisites of online learning, namely a stable internet connection and a mobile gadget, were both absent in some form. At the Al-Bukhari International University, we set up a COVID relief fund for, for our students, which included data packages to facilitate online learning. Second, students from low-income households shifted to the informal labor market during this period to support their fa families financially. The value of education depleted further, resulting in a growing number of potential students being forced into low-skilled labor. A UN report published just last week indicates that in 2016, 75 million school-aged children across 40 countries required educational support. 
Today, that number has risen to 222 million children. The statistics have tripled in just six years, and 84% of these children live in protracted crises. These crises are man-made. For as long as greed continues to infect politicians and those at the decision-making table, there will always be an underprovision of education. Educational reform requires a long gestation period and would naturally supersede any politician in power. Hence, there is often minimal incentive for a leader with a fixed term in office to build the country's human capital. The pandemic was an acid test, not just to the country's healthcare system, but also to its education system. The Human Development Index, which has its own set of limitations, still cites the years of schooling as one of the key parameters to measure development. While the intervention to create greater access to relevant, good quality education must take place at all levels, fundamentally it starts with teachers. Therefore, training teachers who will then shape the next generation of children and indirectly contribute to the human capital of every country is what we strive to achieve at the Al Bukhari International University whose student population is 80% international. In line with this, we offer two undergraduate programs in elementary education and early childhood education. Early intervention is not only important for brain development, but it is the best way to harness talent, reduce education inequity, and provide the necessary skills for learning. Thank you, Dr. Faiz. Thank you very much. Well, yes, I think you've touched upon this uh, very important aspect of uh, access again, uh, and that the gap between what children need to access and what they are able to access has widened. This is alarming. Although this conversation is about higher education, but schools are the feeders into the higher education system. And if we're, if we're denying access to children, we're also denying access to talent that will otherwise be an asset to higher education. But on the other hand, the teacher training aspect is something that uh, again comes up again and again because uh, if there are no uh, good teachers uh, it's very unlikely that there's going to be very good higher education candidates that i think is a topic which uh, again as teachers we run into all the time because uh, a, a phd or a or a, or a postdoctoral qualification does not necessarily build the kind of teacher skills or the kind of teacher empathy that uh, makes teacher a calling rather than you know just a, just a nine to five so uh, allow me to introduce uh, Professor Benedict Clerc-Avigno from um, HEC Paris. Uh, Benedict has been at the forefront and perhaps the first, uh, HEC has been the first institution where formal social business education has taken root. And so with that, I think this, this is a topic that you must have grappled with, Benedict, um, about you know, how to build the teaching empathy, the teaching skills that create the kind of teaching that will motivate change makers. So having asked that question, Benedict, uh, uh, of course, is the executive director of the Society and Organization Institute at AGC. And she's also the uh, executive director of uh, inclusive and social business uh, at the AGC Masters in Sustainable Development. So this entire scope of education experience uh, perhaps points us to building this right kind of teaching skill that you've experienced in, in an otherwise traditional and research-oriented university. So what would you say to this? Thank you very much uh, for this invitation again. So thank you, Professor Shah and Professor Yunus. Uh, happy to be with you uh, this afternoon for us. Um, yes, indeed, I, I think it's, it's something, uh, there is a turning point for us, which is, not necessarily only related to the pandemic, but a new way of teaching. Um, you know, in countries like France, we have insisted a lot on the, the, the you know the head dimension. So training people on uh, uh, theoretical issues and developing their knowledge, which is great, which is necessary. And and today we we really need to develop. Uh, uh, I would say the, the understanding, um, ecosystemic uh, understanding of the complexity of the world, capacity to anticipate trends such as uh, climate change, such as you know, all the consequences of uh, rising inequalities as well. So I think we still need to develop the, uh, this, this kind of uh, skills. 
But this is not enough. And uh, as you mentioned, we also need to develop the heart dimension. So the empathy, uh, because uh, we need also uh, leaders, managers, leaders who are uh, listening to the needs of the people who are listening, you know, observing their reality and not just dis disconnected from the real life. So we need people um, who are able to be immersed. And that's what we try to do, you know, immersing uh, future uh, leaders, future managers into tough realities, sometimes uh, extreme poverty situations. And, you know, in order to develop their capacity to uh, to listen, to just understand the others and develop this, this empathy, which is so important today. And then I think that uh, something important also we try to develop is a kind of self-awareness among the, the students' capacity to, to um, know themselves, uh, their strengths, uh, their weaknesses maybe, and also think about the purpose of life. What, one, what do they want to do with their professional life? and with their life in general. So it's also this kind of uh, introspection, deep questioning that we also try to uh, develop now, which is quite new because again, uh, before we were only uh, teaching maybe uh, theoretical uh, things. And, uh, and the last um, dimension I think is the, the body. Uh, so head, heart and body, we also need courageous people people who will be very determined because they will be facing lots of difficulties as well. And, uh, and, and this, this, uh, this also capacity, yes, to be courageous, I think is really important and also creative. So the idea is, for example, to propose them new pedagogies such as uh, hackathons, uh, where we um, propose them some challenges, uh, and, and this is the, the, the third dimension that we, we also try to insist upon uh, today in, in our um, in a business school like HEC. So it means you know trying to address the, 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 the different dimensions of the, the, the person um, through different pedagogies. So that's I think what is probably new today. And we uh, I think uh, one key objective. Uh, just as a conclusion is also yeah, to have specific um, courses uh, that are completely dedicated to social business, etc. And also uh, what we try to do is uh, to integrate these social environmental dimensions in the core courses of the school. So that's probably our, our main challenge. Thank you so much. Well, there's, uh, there's um... Again, I think time's catching up on us. Uh, Baroness Amos has to leave in the, the next six or seven minutes. So that's a real time signal for Professor Abdulhanan Chaudhry to keep his uh, uh, comments uh, following this one. Uh, I think the, the whole idea that uh, we are leading towards is that you know there, there's a need for a new pedagogy, there's a need for new empathy, there's a need for, and I, I love the three words that you used, resilience, capacity, and courage uh, among teachers that, that can be reflected onto the students so that they become resilient and courageous and uh, build the kind of capacity that change makers do. So Professor Abdul Hanan Chaudhry has had uh, uh, over 30 years of uh, a very, very sort of uh, high performing educational academic career. He's currently the uh, head, the Dean of Business at uh, North South University, one of Bangladesh's top private universities, but he's also been Vice Chancellor Eastern University has also been uh, in a number of positions overseas, including uh, uh, teaching uh, in universities in the US and Canada, including his own alma mater, which is uh, Northeastern University. So enormous global experience of higher education, of, of, of building the kind of uh, education experience that we are now talking about. Professor Chaudhary, uh, having listened to all uh, what, whatever we've just listened to, one thing that jumps out us, uh, at us is now uh, perhaps uh, where is the shift then that we, where is the shift that we have seen in the last few months that will compel us to transform our educational experience as we've heard uh, the panel uh, reflect. Thank you, thank you, Professor Faiz Shah. You know, I I would be very brief. Actually, I would like to echo with Professor you know Valerie 
Armas, the way she started to the discussion in terms of the disparity that has happened actually in, across the world during COVID and also after COVID, we have been observing, you know, how well concentration has happened and also the digital divide. It is clear, actually, we have been observing it categorically that in Bangladesh, even a uh, country like Bangladesh and also in across the world, you know, this pandemic has, in one side, we have seen that, well, technology has facilitated many things in terms of knowledge dissemination and uh, delivering our lectures through technology. But in the other side, the from the receptive side, the student body, they could not actually reach, uh, you know, to the system that we have been running just because they do not have the access of uh, digital uh, device and, uh, you know, uh, they are unprivileged. So you see that happen in one side. The other side that Professor Yunus has always been actually talking about building a new civilization because you, we all have observed that when what has happened actually in the oil concentration and even the during pandemic, you remember that the Oxfam has given a new statistics about 573 billionaires, uh, new billionaires have come actually during pandemic within last two, three years. And also 263 million people went down to the extreme poverty level. We see that how this world has actually become dis, you know, dispersed from one side to another side. So if we talk about even disseminating knowledge, you see that from academic side, in one side we are talking about that we are technologically advanced, we can do anything and everything from the service uh, delivery point of view. But in the other side, we see that, well, those who are going to listen us, those who really need to learn things, uh, they are not actually getting the access. So, you know, buying devices, even for many, many children in across the world has become uh, difficult uh, issues. So, you know, pedagogical changes and, uh, you know, these are the things that are obvious that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we need to uh, do because we want to create a sustainable world and a sustainable civilization also. So the, the uh, clear, and I would say that the clear focus has to be on education, education and education. If we cannot simply give educations to the young generation of the people that we call the change makers, how we are going to be able to give them the essence that the world has become you know, you know, you know, uh, divided, and whether they can address all the social causes that can be even addressed by the social business, uh, you know, that we all believe in. So socially uh, impactful business that from the business school teachings point of view, we are always highlighting. We are always talking about the green business, so green world, those things. But how far can we or will we be able to ensure ethical businesses when we see even technology like AI has given the business community and business corporations to maximize their profit. So technology can be used for better side of the you know part. And also it can also be used for maximizing profit for many corporations. They have used artificial intelligence for maximizing their profit in terms of the business modeling. So these are, uh, you know, two way of things. So creating, uh, you know, an ecosystem uh, for, you know, business and also in, 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 you know, a good world that we all are expecting. I think uh, Benedict has also focused that empathy, you know, those things are essential for the faculty members and doing businesses with empathy is also important and understanding the purpose of life is something very uh, important. I would say the value-driven education is important and above everything, uh, the thing that we are heavily, heavily focusing nowadays, what we uh, you know, in terms of diversity, inclusions, and belongingness in the in the university's point of view, so that we can actually incorporate everything in the system. So, in line with this, I think the curriculum, uh, new curriculum, has to be crafted. Uh, you know, for the upcoming generation of the students to be aligned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a new word: curriculum. But uh, I'm mindful of time again. Uh, one of my more unpleasant jobs in this session is to actually make sure we keep to time. I'm not being very successful, but I'm trying. Uh, Baroness Amos, if I may come back to you before you uh, leave, because I know you have a, uh, an appointment coming up. Uh, we gra we're grateful for your time. But what has Oxford, which has for long been considered you know, at the forefront of uh, educational transformation at the same time being very traditional, 
what is Oxford uh, considered doing to shift uh, this uh, towards a new model of inclusive education so that we are preparing people for the next civilization. Uh, thank you um, very much. And it's been fascinating listening to uh, the input from everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, I think that, uh, that at Oxford, um, and remember, um, we also um, have the, the colleges, so you have the collegiate uh, university, as it were, there's a great deal of work that is ongoing in relation to representation, um, the diversity of the student body, for example, the diversity of uh, the faculty. Professor Chowdhury talked about um, curriculum. There are uh, some uh, faculties that are doing um, a lot of work um, on this. Um, it's a very mixed uh, picture. Uh, but I also think that there is a big piece which we have to pay a lot more attention to, which is around culture. I think it's one thing to expand the student body to, uh, you know, look at um, uh, the faculty and the staffing more generally. I think there's a big issue about what is the culture that you then come into and how do you make that culture uh, more inclusive so that when people come in, they don't feel that they have to adapt to the culture, but that they are having an impact in terms of the culture adapting to them and becoming more inclusive through that process. Um, of course, there's a lot of attention that's been paid um, to uh, scholarships, to bursaries. I'm very pleased that my own college, for example, um, has looked at underrepresented groups across the Oxford community, and we have focused uh, bursaries on hard to reach uh, groups, but also groups, uh, for example, from the British Bangladeshi um, community, uh, the British Pakistani community, the African Caribbean community that are underrepresented at uh, uh, Oxford. Um, students who come out of a care background, um, uh, students who are uh, refugees. We also are looking at the admissions um, process it will be online again this year. In the past, it has been face-to-face -face, um, interviews. There is an ongoing discussion about what happens in the future. And uh, by doing online, are we being uh, more inclusive? Are we uh, dealing with some of those cultural stereotypes that um, we all uh, carry? Uh, but I think that this is a work in progress and we are of course looking to learn from others who have uh, maximized opportunities in terms of the impact uh, of uh, the pandemic. And I would just like to say uh, one other thing, which is pointing to uh, Professor Eunice's uh, work. The social impact of all of this and the impact on our students before they get to university, during uh, university and afterwards, um, and the social impact that they will have has to be at the center of education and uh, learning. And I think um, that concept that Professor Eunice has uh, talked about, has promoted for so long, is something that uh, is very much current uh, at the moment. Thank you so much. Well, I think this, this uh, concrete example of you know, building inclusiveness into the culture is, uh, of course, uh, very important to, to mention in this group. And I know it's now exactly 2019 here, which is uh, four minutes over your time. So please feel free whenever you like. We, we hope you can stay longer, but whenever you like, uh, you know, we, we, we're grateful for your joining us today. Uh, but I Thank need you. To <laughs> if you don't mind, I will slip off screen and then discreetly leave. Perfect. Thank you so much. Once Thank, again, you. Uh, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Well, but, but I'm still supposed to keep time, guys. Uh, so running straight into the, the same question, what's being done at Glasgow Caledonian, for instance? Uh, if you'd kindly unmute. It's so good to see other people doing what I do so often. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Shah. And uh, thank you to Baroness Amos for her insightful comments. So I think she's absolutely right. Culture always eats strategy for breakfast, as the saying goes. But developing a good inclusive culture with a strong sense of purpose and belonging uh, does not happen overnight. 
This is a project that will take several years. As the University for the Common Good, we've been working on it for the last 15 years. And we have made progress. And I think one of the most important drivers of a, of a gear change in a sense of belonging and culture and purpose was when Mohammed Yunus became our chancellor and then did focus on, look, let's look at the impact of what we're doing. That's absolutely critical. Um, and we, we did that by adopting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals way back in 2016 as a framework for all we do, not just in research, but for the way we focus on problem solving in the university. Yes, and it speaks to the curriculum, but yes, it speaks to the demonstration initiatives the whole university invests in at home in Scotland and overseas, whether that's with the Grameen Caledonian College of Nursing in Dhaka, the African Leadership University with Graza Machel in Mauritius, or working with industry for workplace learning to be developed amongst uh, the poorest of workers. And all of this, as Barna Seyma said at the beginning, has to be measured and captured because we know we act on what we measure. The world tells us this. And that's why I love the Times Higher Education Global Impact Rankings that were produced in the last three years that absolutely measure the impact of universities on a different landscape of excellence. So it's absolutely critical. And a wee uh, you know, shout out for my university, fourth in the world for, for gender equality, 21st in the world for uh, reducing inequalities, even though we're so a so-called modern university. And that's not at the cost of research excellence. The two aren't mutually exclusive. We're second only to King's College London for our health impact uh, in the research excellence framework recently. So impact is not at the expense of excellence. And Mohammed Yunus has demonstrated that time and time again. But these initiatives do need the courage that our colleague talked about earlier, determination, you've got to stay the course for change. It's within our grasp now, if we don't you know, get hold of this cataclysm of crisis to change the ecosystem, when will we ever? But as I said earlier, I don't think we're there yet. We're just starting to talk about it. Yeah, indeed. It's, a, it's, a, it's going to be an eventful journey too, in, in a way, because uh, we've been uh, uh, groomed into such a conventional, traditional, uh, relatively unchanging model of higher education that we do tweak it at the edges often and call it revolutionary change. But intrinsically, it probably hasn't changed for almost a thousand years. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's good to see that we've got uh, leadership coming in in the shape of, as you said, Professor Yunus's motivation and universities like Glasgow Caledonian willing to take that and, uh, you know, move on with it. Uh, similar. But, but uh, Professor, uh, Shah, yes. Professor Shah, imagine if every university just took on one of Professor Yunus's social impact demonstration initiatives. Think of the scale that could be achieved Amazing. globally. Right. Absolutely. I, 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 it's, it's hard to imagine it not impacting the world. Absolutely agree. Uh, but, but, you know, and we, we move on to Malaysia again. Uh, I'd like to see if um, uh, Al-Bukhari has had, uh, has a strategy and has had some practical uh, work on, on creating the kind of culture, the kind of access, the kind of uh, shift that we are talking about. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pamela. I think you would be pleased to hear that Professor Yunus is a chancellor of our university in Malaysia. <laughs> so he's passed on the baton to us and we're very, very honored to have Professor Yunus at Al Bukhari International University. First, let me begin by saying that education facilitates social mobility. And at the Al Bukhari Foundation, we believe that education is the only equalizer in an attempt to narrow the inequality gap. In the context of higher education, I believe that the purpose of education in building a new civilization is to create an exemplary, exemplary breed of leaders. Leaders who uphold good governance, build social capital, and lead with empathy, compassion, and courage. At the Al-Bukhari International University, we promote a value-based education, where every member of the university must subscribe to the 5A core values, adapt, good manners, akhla, good character, akida, faith and a moral compass, amanah, integrity, and amalan, practicing the above. 
When I reflect on the pandemic, which punctuated the usual course of events and ultimately forced us to rethink about existing social contracts, I realize that the definition of leadership has been put to test. We are facing a leadership crisis and university is a place where students become leaders. As such, it is our responsibility to equip students with the tools that enable them to react to adversity and to address social problems through harnessing their creative power. At the Al Bukhari International University, we turn to social business. The core focus in education for new civilization must revolve around problem solving. And I believe it starts with ownership of the problem. The recognition that poverty, unemployment, inequality, global warming, malnutrition, food security is everyone's problem. Owning these problems will allow for accountability mechanisms to be put in place. At the Al Bukhari International University, each faculty member must own one of the three zeros. We have three schools, and within each school, there will be a proportionate number of faculty owning zero poverty, zero unemployment, and zero net carbon emissions. Their research will be aligned to this, and student activities will also operate within these boundaries. Membership of the three zero club will be compulsory across all members of our university. Lastly, if our leaders struggle to orchestrate a functioning economy amidst the pandemic, the pandemic being an immediate crisis with detrimental effects on the economy, then whose interest is it in to understand and address the root cause of poverty, which is multidimensional in nature? I believe that it is the responsibility of universities to step up and produce a new generation of socially conscious youth who will redesign the economic system. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. We're also filling the chat box with some very interesting questions. So I'm going to just move on very quickly to Professor Tavigno to look at what ATC is doing in uh, building for this shift in, uh, you know, uh, more humane, more people centric education. And where, where, where do you think you see ATC leading the way? Well, <clears throat> thank you. Um... As I, I said, I, um, so I, I think we have created uh, innovative programs like the social business certificate and, uh, that we've been uh, running uh, for more than 14 years. And Professor Yunus, uh, uh, nearly each year, each year honors us to, to, be, to be with the, the, the participants today on Zoom mostly, but uh, you know, it's... Um, these are, I think, yes, innovative programs that we have created. We have created other courses where we we send uh, students uh, um, to spend a few weeks uh, with social entrepreneurs on on the field. Uh, we focus quite a lot also on um, business model innovation, how to rethink the whole business model. So it's. Uh, but the, the main challenge, as I mentioned earlier, is really to uh, embed all this in the core curriculum. So that's uh, what we, we say. So it's uh, working with uh, the, the leaders of the school, uh, working with the different professors so that they integrate all these dimensions in the courses uh, in finance, courses in economics, courses in uh, uh, marketing, uh, classes of, uh, you know, uh, operations, uh, law, all the different courses that we have, uh, we try to also uh, change the way we teach these uh, classical uh, disciplines and, uh, and really change the mindset and so that um, they're all taking into account, you know, uh, like accounting, how to assess uh, the, the the environmental impact and social impact of the company, not only the financial performance, but also uh, all these different uh, performances. So that's that's our main goal: is really to transform the the mainstream business in a way through transforming our core curriculum. That's that's a real challenge. Excellent. Well, thanks. We, we look to ATC always, of course, as uh, you, you've been in the field the longest, and uh, we all in this group continue to be inspired by Professor Eunice's direction. So all the best, and I think we, we will all eventually be able to steer uh, at least a chunk of uh, what we do into the right direction. Uh, 
Professor Chaudhary, uh, how is it at North, North South? Um, yeah, yeah. May I hear again? Yeah, I mean, the question was, uh, what is North South doing oh, in okay. anticipation I of see. the transition? Yeah, first of all, uh, we, we all agree and we all understand the paradigm shift in even in the education sector has happened due to all those issues that we all have talked about in terms of the disparity and also the technological convergence that had happened actually. Uh, look at this scenario in our country. There is an economic uh, shift is also going on and the young bodies, those who are coming into the university system, they are coming from a supply source from across the country. But we have, we have not been able to ensure the ethical and moral uh, education in the primary and also tertiary education so that all responsibility comes into the university when parents and guardians and everybody is sending their kids to the higher learning institutions, assuming that we will be able to transform anybody and everybody in the campus while they are actually staying for four years. And we are going to transform them they have to be socially oriented. They have to understand the social cause. They have. We are doing actually lots of activities in our campus in terms of giving all sort of understanding that ethical practice, moral practice, and the way you know corruptions and all these things going on in in across the world even uh, as being a human being. Or what would be the priority for a young individual in terms of becoming the leader for the next, uh, you know, uh, or, or few, for future. So we are giving in one side all those, uh, you know, things to the student body. But on the other hand, we also see that enormous number of students are actually uh, looking forward to see that they are going to be a job seeker rather than even becoming an entrepreneur uh, or, or somebody who is going to uh, be a self, uh, uh, you know, uh, who is going to be someone who is going to create some employability for other people. We don't see that courage actually of the student and also our society do not actually support them a lot. So young youths are actually confused. We are always running seminars, symposiums, workshops, activities to even motivate them and guide them that you your, your selfless part, which Professor Yunus always try to you know, put on the top that selfless part has enormous power. This kind of things that we are trying to give and disseminate those things to the young body. Uh, it would be a challenge for us, but we are taking that challenge. Uh, we have no other choice, understanding the current state of the, uh, you know, economic shift and also technological shift that has happened. The students are are, are, are short-sighted, you know, in one sense in our country. They, they do not want to most of them, I'm not saying that, well, uh, in our country, we do not have, we have plenty of students. We see that they are very socially concerned. They want to do even good social businesses, but our ecosystem do not support them. So, or even the curricula, we could not, uh, and, you know, I mean, you know, put those things in, in, in the forefront. So they are uh, heavily concerned and sustainable issues we are, which we are actually emphasizing to within our faculty members to do research on SDG issues. And we are narrowing it down to three zero type of goals so that we can see that our faculty members are going to be involved in researching on all, uh, you know, net carbon emissions to even uh, reducing poverty and also reducing uh, unemployment. And what are the ways and means to do those kind of things? In one side, we are trying to train our faculty members to be focused and aligned with those kind of uh, you know, arena, because I think the university in higher learning institutions, thought leadership is, is, uh, is not there. So we do not see that the schools and universities and colleges are run by people, those who have some thought uh, leadership in terms of aligning uh, things together. So that's the challenge, like this DOA uh, Albukari was actually mentioning in their school, they have been able to successfully uh, streamline those things, 3-0 goals, 3-0 clubs, 3-0 initiatives and mandatory giving those things, you know, in our country, uh, not everything is possible uh, because of the magnitude of the 
number of students and uh, from the uh, service delivery point of view when we are running in a structured uh, you know curricula based program uh, you simply cannot incorporate and give everything in the uh, service line but right. we always call students to come forward and join with us and try to motivate yourself to resolve social issues, issues even designing a business. That's a very social interesting business. point, uh, Professor Chaudhary, that you make. And uh, I think this is a question which perhaps is designed for Professor Yunus, because when you, you say that uh, things don't work out, it's an unfair environment, the motivation is lacking, there's so many things going against, uh, you know, uh, our efforts that in four years, how can we change? So, sir, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, request you to jump into this one because this is a question right for you. Uh, there's also two other questions which echo some of this uh, from Astra EA. Uh, one is that education is about learning and not only teaching. And this is what Professor Hanan Chaudhary has just said also. And also that competitiveness must be replaced by uh, collaboration. So, sir, would you like to kind of conclude this for us and uh, uh, also address these questions. Uh, so you have to unmute, please. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I was just referring to Professor uh, Chaudhary's comments that yes, yes, there are lots of difficulties, hurdles, and so on. Uh, but we must make a beginning. That's what the whole thing. The, uh, we cannot just wait for uh, everything to be uh, removed, everything to get out of the way, and then we begin. And Professor Chodi understands it very well. He took a lot of initiatives. He keeps trying that. So this is the focus that I make, that we might start with small steps. Uh, we don't have to do the whole thing overnight right away. So this is one direction that we have. Uh, the, the, the one which uh, education part uh, bothers me is the continuity, uh, continuity of the civilization, because education has become the vehicle of continuity. And uh, that's a problem. Uh, we are not challenging uh, what we are handing over to our young people. Uh, the, 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 the kind of, we are saying that we, this civilization is in crisis and confluence of all the disasters that were coming on our way, uh, with the, beginning with the global warming and all that, and then coming with the con, uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic, and then coming with the global uh, war situation that we have right now with the impact of it. So all this confluence uh, doesn't leave us any option, but to find the escape route from this civilization that we created and led us into this situation where we don't have much time left. So before it's too late, we have to squeeze out and take a route to get out of this and create a new civilization and find out what are the ills of this civilization that we are passing through. And we have discussed many issues on that, uh, what is wrong with that. So education continues to pass it on and not challenging it, like, look, we are not going to pass it on. We have to create a new civilization. We have to take new steps. We have added lots of issues in the discussion here. We talked about entrepreneurship. We talked about the creativity and so on, uh, but it's not integrated in the whole education system yet. So, the, and I keep saying that we are not job seekers. We are uh, uh, entrepreneurs. We are uh, endowed with the unlimited creative capacity. We can do anything we want. Each one is you keep those kind of things that I try to push into the idea. Maybe these are the things important for education side. And then education, I try to uh, uh, give a very simple kind of uh, uh, image by saying that we are in a spaceship planet and uh, we, we take our students to train them as the passengers, as crews of this spaceship. Uh, we never thought that we need to give them a capacity and imagination to design a flight path. Where do we want to take this one? That's not part of our education. We don't challenge, we, we take the flight path as it is. We, this is the direction we go. Uh, we don't challenge it. So we become crew, we become passengers. We never thought about designing our flight path. 
And that's the most important thing. Even at the, at the very uh, lowest level of education, uh, preliminary level of education in the kindergarten school, they can design things for themselves, imagination. And we, as we go along step by step, that will grow with us. That how, what, what is our uh, flight plan? Where do we want to go? By the time I finish my education or uh, get complete my uh, courses and so on, I know exactly what kind of world I want uh, because I've gone through that exercises and so on. So I become a designer of the flight path. If, uh, we design the flight path and also become the pilot of the uh, spaceship. So we are not pilots. This is my problem. The, we are not independently pilots of this ship. The, the, take this uh, spaceship in the direction that we want. Uh, and along this, if we raise this question uh, about the uh, uh, designing the flight path and so on, imagination becomes the most important thing. Imagine the world that you want to take, uh, we want to go to. Uh, and that imagination should be part of education. It's not what is happening, what's a, quote unquote real. Unreal thing is very important because unless we imagine uh, collectively, individually, step by step, we are not going anywhere. We'll just repeat the same cycle over and over again. Continuity of the civilization. We'll never find a new civilization. So I'm appealing that education should be uh, broken out, should be taken out to become uh, in a different direction, uh, to take a, a path different than what we have been teaching. All day. And that will come naturally organically, not somebody imposing that this is part we have done. Because you, you take the question to the students, what kind of world you want? This is a very fun question. They start with the fun question that gradually become serious about it. And continue year after year as they go for grade after grade, they start debating, discussing, and started designing individually and collectively what kind of world we want. So that's the world that we want to build. And as I grow up, I try to see that, yes, it's my capability and I can do that. If I imagine, it will. I'll try to make it happen. That's the whole issue. So education is good, but it's not a system where we hand over the existing civilization to continue because the existing civilization is dated. It's not going to go, taking us very far. There is, there is no escape route from it right now. So we want to find something very concrete through education. So education plays a very important role in creating a new world that we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's, a, that's a, you know, for me, it's always inspirational, but creativity seems to be at the root of this. The, the whole idea of uh, converting conventional systems to, uh, to systems that challenge, that create, uh, that create, that innovate is a challenge for all of us as uh, educators but perhaps a bigger challenge for uh, vice chancellors and principals and uh, uh, deans and uh, you know people who are despite their con constraints associated with these expectations uh, but uh, so so i'd like to thank uh, thank you sir for this uh, insight and i'd also like to thank everyone on the panel uh, baroness amos is left but uh, professor Elise, uh, professor chaudhry sharifa hari um, and of course, uh, the, the backstage team here that uh, we've had, uh, the, and of course, Professor Tavinio, and the backstage team uh, with Sadia, Urmi, Zafir, and everybody else that's uh, supported this uh, program so beautifully. And thank you, Lamia, for having all of us here. And thank you, sir, once again. Uh, we, I'd like to conclude the second panel. We've taken 48 minutes instead of 45, so that's not too far off. That's the we'll be back on track. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, for all sure. you listening. Thank, thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.